Second story, a little boy and a little girl. In the big city, it was so crowded with houses and people that few found room for even a small garden, and most people had to be content with a flower pot. But two poor children who lived there managed to have a garden that was a little bigger than a flower pot. These children were not brother and sister, but they loved each other just as much as if they had been. Their parents lived close to one another in the garrets of two adjoining houses. Where the roofs met and where the rain gutter ran between the two houses, their two small windows faced each other. One had to only step across the rain gutter to go from window to window. In these windows, the parents had a large box where they planted vegetables for their use, and in a little rose bush, too. Each box had a bush which thrived to perfection. Then it occurred to the parents to put these boxes across the gutter, where they very nearly reached from one window to the other, and looked exactly like two walls of flowers. The pea plants hung down over the boxes, and the rose bushes threw out long sprays that framed the windows and bent over toward each other. It was almost like a little triumphant arch of greenery and flowers. The boxes were very high, and the children knew that they were not to climb about on them, but they were often allowed to take their little stools out on the roof under the roses, where they had a wonderful time playing together. Winter, of course, put an end to this pleasure. The windows often frosted over completely, but they would heat copper pennies on the stove and press those hot coins against the frost-coated glass. Then they had the finest of peepholes, as round as a ring, and behind them appeared a bright, friendly eye, one at each window. It was, a little, it was the little boy and the little girl who peeped out. His name was Kay, and hers was Gerda. With one skip, they could join each other in the summer, but to visit together in the wintertime, they had to go all the way downstairs in one house and climb all the way upstairs in the other. Outside, the snow was whirling. See them white bees swarming, the old grandmother said. Do they have a queen bee too, the little boy asked, for he knew that real bees have one. Yes, indeed they do, the grandmother said. She flies in the thick of the swarm. She's the biggest bee of all and can never stay quietly on earth, but goes back again to the dark clouds. Many a wintry night she flies through the streets and peers in through the windows. Then they freeze over in a strange fashion as if they were covered with flowers. Oh, yes, we've seen that, both children said, and so they knew it was true. Can the Snow Queen come in here? the little girl asked. Well, let her come, cried the boy. I would put her on the hot stove and melt her. But Grandmother stroked his head and told the mother stories. That evening, when little Kay was at home and half ready for bed, he climbed on the chair by the window and looked out through the little peephole. A few snowflakes were falling, and the largest flake of all alighted on one of the flower boxes. This flake grew bigger and bigger, until at last it turned into a woman, who was dressed in the finest white gauze, which looked as if it had been made of a million star-shaped flakes. She was beautiful, and she was graceful, but she was ice-shining, glittering ice. She was alive for all that, and her eyes sparkled like two bright stars. But in them there was neither rest nor peace. She nodded toward the window and beckoned with her hand. The little boy was frightened, and as he jumped down from the chair, it seemed to him that a huge bird flew past the window. And the next day was clear and cold. Then the snow thawed and springtime came. The sun shone, the green grass sprouted, swallows made their nests, windows were thrown over and once thrown open, and once again the children played in their little roof garden high up on the rain gutter on top of the house. That summer the roses bloomed their splendid best. The little girl had learned a hymn in which there was a line about how the roses reminded her of her own flowers. She sang it to the little boy, and he sang it with her. Where roses bloom so sweetly in the vale, there you shall find the Christ child without fail. The chil children held each other by the hand, kissed the roses, looked up at the Lord's clear sunshine, and spoke to it as if the Christ child were there. What glorious summer days those were, and how beautiful it was under those fragrant rose bushes, which seemed as if they would never stop blooming. Kay and Gerda were looking at a picture book of birds and beasts one day, and it was then, just as the clock in the church tower was striking five, that Kay cried, Oh, something hurt my heart, and now I've got something in my eye. The little girl put her arm around his neck, and he blinked his eye. 
No, she couldn't see anything in it. I think it's gone, he said, but it was not gone. It was one of those splinters of glass from the magic mirror. You remember the goblin's mirror, the one which made everything great and good that was reflected in it appear small and ugly, but which magnified all the evil things until each blemish loomed large. Poor Kay, a fragment had pierced his heart as well, and would soon turn it into a lump of ice. The pain had stopped, but the glass was still there. Why should you be crying, he asked. It makes you look so ugly. There's nothing the matter with me. And suddenly he took it into his head to say, Ugh, that rose is all worm-eaten, and look at that one is crooked. And these roses, they're just as ugly as they can be. They look like the boxes they grow in. He gave the boxes a kick and broke off one of the roses. Kay, what are you doing? The little girl cried. When he saw how it upset her, he broke off another rose and then leaped home through his own window, leaving dear little Gerda all alone. Afterwards, when she brought out her picture book, he said it was fit only for babies in the cradle, and whenever Grandmother told stories, he always broke in with a but. If he could manage it, he would steal behind her, perch a pair of spectacles on his nose, and imitate her. He did this so cleverly that it made everybody laugh, and before long he could mimic the walk and the talk of everyone who lived on the street. Everything that was odd or ugly about them, Kay could mimic so well that people said, that boy has surely got a good head on him. But it was the glass in his eye and the glass in his heart that made him tease even little Gerda, who loved him with all her soul. Now his games were very different from what they used to be. They became more sensible. When the snow was flying about one wintry day, he brought a large magnifying glass out of doors and spread the tail of his blue coat to let the snowflakes fall on it. Now look through the glass, he told Gerda. Each snowflake seemed much larger and looked like a magnificent flower or a ten-pointed star. It was marvelous to look at. Look how artistic, said Kay. They are much more interesting to look at than real flowers, for they are absolutely perfect. There isn't a flaw in them until they start melting. A little while later, Kay came down with his big gloves on his hands and his sled on his back. Right in Gerda's ears, he bawled out. I've been given permission to play in the big square where the other boys are, and he ran away. In the square, some of the more adventurous boys would tie their little sleds on behind the farmer's carts to be pulled along for quite a distance. It was a wonderful sport. When the fun was at its height, a big sleigh drove up. It was painted entirely white, and the driver wore a white shaggy fur cloak and a white shaggy cap. As the slave drove twice around the square, Kay quickly hooked his little sled behind it, and down the street they went faster and faster. The driver turned around in a friendly fashion and nodded to Kay, just as if they were old acquaintances. Every time Kay started to unfasten his little sleigh, its driver nodded again and Kay held on, even when they drove right out through the town gate. Then the snow began to fall so fast that the boy could not see his hands up in front of him as they sped on. He suddenly let go of the slack of the rope in his hands in order to get loose from the big sleigh, but it did no good. His little sled was tied on securely, and they went like the wind. He gave a loud shout, but nobody heard him. The snow whirled and the sleigh flew along. Every now and then it gave a jump as if it were clearing hedges and ditches. The boy was terror-stricken. He had tried to say his prayers, but all he could remember was his multiplication tables. The snowflakes got bigger and bigger, until they looked like big white hens. All of a sudden, the kernel of snow parted and the big sleigh stopped and the driver stood up. The fur coat and the cap were made of snow, and it was a woman, tall and slender and blinding white. She was the Snow Queen herself. We have made good time, she said. Is it possible that you tremble from the cold? Crawl under my bear coat. She took him up in the sleigh beside her, and as she wrapped the fur about him, he felt as if he were sinking into a snowdrift. Are you still cold, she asked, and kissed him on the forehead. Rrr, that kiss was colder than ice. He felt it right down to his heart, half of which was already an icy lump. He felt as if he were dying, but only for a moment. Then he felt quite comfortable and no longer noticed the cold. My sled. Don't forget my sled. It was the only thing he thought of. They tied it to one of the white hens which flew along after them with the sled on its back. 
The Snow Queen kissed Kay once more, and he forgot little Gerda and Grandmother and all the others at home. You won't get any more kisses now, she said, or else I should kiss you to death. Kay looked at her. She was so beautiful, a cleverer and prettier face he could not imagine. She no longer seemed to be made of ice as she had seemed when he, she sat outside his window and beckoned to him. In his eyes, she was perfect, and she was not at all afraid. He told her how he could do mental arithmetic, even with fractions, and they knew the size and population of all the countries. She kept on smiling, and he began to be afraid that he did not know as much as he thought he did. He looked up at the great big space overhead as she flew him high up in up on the black clouds while the storm whistled and roared as they were singing old ballads they flew over forests and lakes over many a land and sea below them the wind blew cold wolves howled and black crows screamed as they skimmed across the glittering snow but up above the moon shone bright and large and on it Kay fixed his eyes through that long long winter night but by day he slept at the feet of the snow queen